There was a time when meat literally reigned in Kentucky. In 1876, Olympia Springs residents were going about their daily routines when suddenly meat started falling from the clear blue sky. The meat covered an area measuring 100 yards by 50 yards. Residents gathered to witness the occurrence. Some daring ones ventured to taste the meat to guess its origin. With time, most locals lost interest. Yet, there was a dedicated scientist who proposed an intriguing explanation. The meat hailed from vultures. It turns out it might have been a bunch of vultures vomit. Ew. When distressed, vultures tend to extract the food out of their tummies. This makes them lighter for a swift escape. The condition of the meat combined with this theory might explain the mysterious event. And this isn't the only weird thing that has fallen from above. Animal rain is a thing, and it can rain fish and frogs. In 1994, a jelly-like substance fell to the ground in Oakville. Star jelly was a mysterious slime. It caused almost all residents to get sick with flu-like symptoms. Experts analyzed the substance and found out that it contained human white blood cells and two types of bacteria. One of them can be found in the human digestive system. The origin of the substance and its connection to the flu-like symptoms remain unknown. Contrary to folklore, attributing its origin to the sky, star jelly can have diverse sources. It might originate from the oviducts of frogs or form through the clustering of gelatinous aquatic animals. Certain types of fungi, particularly when in a state of decay, can take on a jelly-like consistency, and even slime molds can exhibit similar characteristics. Now, imagine being scared of spiders, and then seeing this. In eastern Brazil, there was an incidence of spiders falling from the sky. In fact, spider rain isn't as unusual as you might think. This has happened in places like Florida, Argentina, and other parts of the world. It turns out there are spiders that live and hunt together. They make a big web between bushes and trees to catch more bugs. But a strong wind can rip the web and carry the spiders into the air, making it look as if spiders are raining down. The next one on the list of odd stuff falling from the sky is golf balls. On a day in September 1969, golfers in Florida experienced this phenomenon. Suddenly, loads of golf balls started dropping from the sky right onto the golf course. Weather experts said that a tornado had passed by the coast and scooped up some water from a pond near the golf course. The tornado had also grabbed a bunch of balls along the way. When it calmed down, all these balls fell down. Another interesting case occurred in the Pacific Northwest. Milky rain was brought by a dust storm over a saline-rich Oregon lake. At first, scientists thought it was caused by wind erosion in burned areas but that didn't match the wind direction. Another clue was the water composition. It was similar to that of a dry lake. Then, they figured it could have come from Summer Lake in Oregon. It's a shallow lake that dries up during droughts. A storm with strong winds had hit the lake the night before the Milky Rain, possibly lifting dust into the air. The Milky Rain left a white residue on cars and windows in 15 cities. Blood rain, or red rain, might sound like a horror movie plot, but it's real. This rain, which looks like blood, has been mystifying people since the times of Homer's Iliad. Back then, people thought it was real blood falling from the sky, and it was seen as a bad omen. But scientists have stepped in to clear things up. This rain is usually caused by some pretty harmless stuff, like red dust or tiny microorganisms floating around in the water. Sometimes, it's the work of green microalgae. Watermelon snow might sound tempting, but it's not a snack. Even in small amounts, it could lead to unpleasant health issues. The alga nivalis actually colors this snow pink. Unlike typical algae that prefers ponds, this one thrives in snow. It's mostly found in high-altitude areas during the summer. This algae turns the snow reddish-pink, and these patches are often mistaken for blood stains. The red color actually helps protect the algae from harsh UV rays. Around two million years ago, a highly saline water reservoir appeared beneath Taylor Glacier, secluded from light, oxygen, and warmth. 
As this salt-laden water delicately traverses a crevice in the glacier, it reacts with airborne oxygen. This creates a breathtaking rust-colored cascade. A phenomenon called blood falls formed in these conditions. It's both a visual spectacle and a scientific marvel. You can only go to the glacier by helicopter or by cruise ship since it's in an exclusive location. The name Blood Falls describes the scene. The sight of slowly streaming scarlet red liquid staining the pristine white surface of Taylor Glacier and Lake Bonnie below. Despite appearances, the substance is not actual blood or water tinted by red algae, as speculated by early Antarctic pioneers. The striking ochre hue emanates from an incredibly salty subglacial lake that has been secluded beneath the glacier for millennia. Speaking of lakes and reservoirs, there's a special place called Lake Hillier in Western Australia. That's part of a group of lakes with a shocking bubblegum pink color. This lake sits on the edge of Middle Island. It's surrounded by a thin ring of sand and a beautiful forest of paper bark and eucalyptus trees. The lake's unique pink hue is a bit of a mystery. Scientists aren't sure about the source of this color. Some think it could be green algae, holding a red-orange pigment, or a type of microorganism. Another possibility is a high concentration of pink brine prawn. Tourists often enjoy the stunning view of Lake Hillier from a helicopter or plane. But if you visit, there's a cool bonus. The lake is really salty, but not harmful. So you can actually go for a swim. Because of the high salt content, you'll float easily like a cork in the water. Let's brighten the mood even more. A sun dog, with its cool name, is a fascinating and rare sight. To witness one, you need luck and the right conditions. Specifically, the sun needs to be at a 22 degree angle. The sky should have a cirrus or a cirrostratus clouds. They contain ice crystals. When everything aligns perfectly, the clouds, the sun, and your viewpoint, you'll get treated to a sun dog. It's also known as a mock sun. This phenomenon creates a stunning effect, where the sun seems to be encircled by a giant halo of light. You'll see two additional suns at the edges of this halo. These extra suns sometimes look smaller than the real sun and might have spikes or coronas radiating from them. Now, we have a newly found phenomenon, atmospheric lakes and rivers. These are as intriguing as their names suggest. Atmospheric rivers have been known for a bit longer and are quite extraordinary. Such rivers can stretch up to 1,000 miles in length and 400 miles in width. They're essentially streams of water vapor in the sky. When they descend, they can release an enormous amount of water sometimes equating to the flow of 25 Mississippi rivers. There are also atmospheric lakes for those who find atmospheric rivers a bit overwhelming. Those are large bodies of water vapor, similar to lakes floating in the clouds. Yet, they're not moving as swiftly as their river counterparts. An atmospheric lake found over the Indian Ocean was estimated to hold enough water to form a shallow puddle stretching 620 miles wide. These lakes typically develop in almost windless areas, often near the equator and coastal regions. They can persist for almost a week, drifting leisurely and often bringing rain to dry and barren regions. You're walking home quite late at night. It's been raining, and now the air is fresh and damp. And that's when you see it. A rainbow! But it's nighttime. Is it even real? Well, it is, because it's a lunar rainbow, also known as a moonbow. Moonbows are as cool as they are rare. They occur when the light gets refracted through water droplets in the air, just like it happens when a normal rainbow forms. But the source of light, in this case, is different. I'm sure you've already guessed that it's the moon. Or rather, sunlight reflected off the moon. Since moonbows are produced at night, when there's much less light, they're a lot more difficult to spot. Often, a moonbow looks like a pale white ring. That's because the light is normally so faint that the cone color receptors in human eyes can't detect the hues. 
Also, experts claim that how bright the colors are depends on the size of water droplets in the air. The smaller they are, the less vivid the colors. If you want to witness a moonbow, opt for a night when the moon is at its fullest, for example, during a full moon phase. The moon also has to be low in the sky and not obscured by clouds. In the US, you can see moonbows next to waterfalls, including Niagara Falls, as well as Yosemite National Park and other places. But you can see mesmerizing natural phenomena not only at night after the rain. For example, look at these brinicles. They are hollow icicles, also known as underwater stalactites. They form when cold salt water freezes in the right conditions. Then, brinicles can reach the ocean floor and start pulling there. They can even freeze some slow-moving underwater inhabitants, like starfish. This next phenomenon is even more dangerous than brinicles. Sinkholes occur when water that has turned acidic after coming into contact with plants or carbon dioxide erodes soft kinds of rock, like gypsum or limestone. This forms a deep underground cavern that can one day open anywhere, even under your house. One such sinkhole opened up in New York City. It pulled a parked van into the earth. It happened in the summer of 2022, and it wasn't the only sinkhole to appear in that area. Local inhabitants reported around 4,000 sinkholes all over the city. This kind of problem is also very common in Florida, and it's much more serious than it may sound. Sinkholes open all of a sudden, pulling down everything and everyone that happens to be nearby. Sinkholes appear all over the world, which makes them a global problem. They're totally unpredictable and form without warning. Another reason for their formation might be vast areas of groundwater. During droughts, this water dries up. This creates large, empty caverns. After heavy rains, the surface over such a cavern can collapse, creating a sinkhole within minutes. This phenomenon is way more beautiful and way less dangerous than sinkholes. Just look at this beach. Is it glowing? Your eyes aren't deceiving you. You can see this phenomenon all over the world. It's caused by phytoplankton in the water. It gives off light when the movements of waves and currents disturb it. This particular species of phytoplankton glows blue, turning the ocean into a gigantic lava lamp. At the same time, if you saw it during the day, you'd probably feel disgusted because the thick visible layer of the plankton near the surface of the water doesn't look, well, nice. Water spouts are also known as sea tornadoes. They occur over warm ocean waters. Water spouts look like funnel-shaped clouds reaching down from the stormy skies. Most of them don't pull in water. They're rather weak rotating columns of air hovering above the surface of the water. Some water spouts begin as dry land tornadoes. Then they travel toward a body of water and turn into severe thunderstorms with hail, high winds, and lightning. During the summer, in forests all over the world, you might see a faint eerie glow called foxfire. It might look mystical and a bit scary, but the nature of this glow is very simple. It's produced by bioluminescent mushrooms growing on moist, rotting bark. You can find lots of these mushrooms in the tropics, where damp forests encourage their growth. To increase your chances of seeing some of those magical fungi, hunt them in the forest during the wettest season. Plus, move as far away from artificial light sources as possible. Otherwise, you won't be able to spot this faint glow. And if you find one, Nope, don't do that. They're not that kind of mushroom. Fire rainbows are another phenomenon that occurs in the summer. They appear when sunlight interacts with frozen ice crystals in high-altitude clouds. Interestingly, for a fire rainbow to appear, you don't need any rain. That's why scientists prefer to refer to this beautiful natural phenomenon by its official name, the circumhorizontal arc. This arc occurs when the sun is very high in the sky, and there's one special variety of clouds. That's why you're more likely to see fire rainbows closer to the equator. In other words, if you're in Los Angeles, 
you can spot them for six months out of the year, while in more northern cities, like London, this window is merely two months. Look at this cute roll! It looks handmade, but it's actually a natural phenomenon called the snow roller. Snow rollers are formed when there's a thick layer of fresh snow that covers a layer of ice. When the temperature and wind speed are just right, some snow breaks loose and starts rolling. While rolling, it picks up additional snow and ends up as a large snow donut. The conditions creating these pastries must be very precise. That's why they're quite rare. Have you ever climbed the stairs of the Giant's Causeway in Ireland? They sure look as if they were created by people. But in fact, this absolutely awesome formation is natural and has a scientific name, columnar basalt. These mostly hexagonal columns have a volcanic origin. They appear when lava cools very fast, contracting and creating various cracks in the surface of the new rock. Now look at the sky, fast! This phenomenon is extremely rare, so you'd be very lucky to witness it. These clouds are called asparatus, and they managed to avoid being classified until 2009. They seem to be ominous and stormy, but in most cases, they break up very quickly without producing a storm. Blink, and you'll miss them. These clouds get formed when colliding air masses or turbulent winds whip up the bottoms of cloud layers, creating amazing shapes. Now put on your winter jacket. We're heading to the north to look at very unusual icebergs. The thing is, not all of these formations are monochrome. Some of them have different colored stripes, which stand out starkly against the whites and blues of the Arctic. The process of the formation of these stripes is quite simple. See for yourself. Water melts and freezes on an iceberg, with dirt and particles of different minerals getting trapped on its surface. They create multicolored stripes with a variety of colors. As for these blue stripes, they appear when water gets trapped between two layers of ice and freezes so fast that air bubbles don't have enough time to form. And if an iceberg breaks off and falls into the ocean, algae present in the water might create yellow or green stripes. If a storm holds back your long-awaited picnic, keep calm and think about how lucky you are that it's not the Katatumbo, the world's longest lightning storm. The heart of the storm, which repeats every year, is over Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. It towers way higher than your regular thunderstorm. This natural phenomenon occurs for a whopping 140 to 160 nights a year, lasts for nine hours a day, and produces 16 to 40 lightning flashes per minute. You've probably heard how they say that lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. Well. The Catatumbo seems to not know about this rule, or at least it doesn't prevent storm clouds from gathering in the very same place year after year. Earth's magnetic field hides a fascinating story. It turns out that it's getting weaker day by day. In fact, it's been doing so for the last 3,000 years, and if this trend continues, we could be in for some trouble within a millennium. What's the big deal? Well, picture this. Magnetic north becomes south, and vice versa. Pretty wild, right? When this happens, our planet's protective magnetic shield might weaken, allowing more cosmic rays to hit us. These high-energy particles from the universe can cause electronic malfunctions in our satellites and produce elements that could be harmful to us. The last time a polarity reversal occurred was between 772,000 and 774,000 years ago. Thankfully, humanity has some pretty smart people on the case who are investigating the history of Earth's magnetic field. They take cores of sediments from the seafloor and study the magnetization of fossils to figure out when these reversals occurred in the past and when they might happen again. Another group of researchers is studying the South Atlantic Anomaly, SAA, a vast region of Earth's magnetic field that is about three times weaker than the field at the poles. 
Using data from multiple satellites, they are trying to figure out what's causing the SAA and how it might change in the future. This could give us a glimpse into how a weakened magnetic field can affect our satellites and our planet. Sure, our generation won't be here to witness these changes, but it does make you wonder what that planet might look like upside down. Magnetically, that is. NASA's astronomers have also announced that in 4 billion years, the Milky Way galaxy is going to get a major glow up. After a cosmic collision that will shake things up, I'm not talking about a small fender bender here, I'm talking about a titanic collision with our neighboring Andromeda galaxy. Humanity will have to hold on to its space helmet for this one because the sun might get flung into a new region of the galaxy. However, our Earth and solar system probably won't be seriously affected. Sounds difficult to believe, so how come? NASA's Hubble Space Telescope did some hardcore measurements of Andromeda's motion. Although the galaxies will plow into each other, the stars inside each galaxy are so far apart that they won't collide with other stars during the encounter. However, the stars will be thrown into different orbits around their new galactic centers. According to simulations, our solar system will probably be tossed much farther from the galactic core than it is today. Set your telescopes aside, you don't need to start counting down the years. This event is likely scheduled in about 4 billion years, so chances for us to witness it are zero. Saturn is losing its rings. Thankfully, we won't be here to witness this sad event either. Apparently, the rings are being pulled into Saturn as a dusty rain of ice particles, all under the influence of Saturn's magnetic field. According to NASA's research, the ring rain is draining an amount of water products that could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool from Saturn's rings every half an hour. The entire ring system will likely be gone in 300 million years. Scientists believe we should consider ourselves lucky to witness Saturn's ring system at all, as it seems to be in the middle of its lifetime. But if you think about it that way, that rings around planets are all temporary, there's a chance we've just missed out on the giant ring system of Jupiter, or those of Uranus and Neptune. These planets have only thin ringlets around them these days. Scientists have long debated whether Saturn was formed together with its rings or if the planet acquired them later in life. The new research favors the second scenario, indicating that they are unlikely to be older than 100 million years, while Saturn itself is around 4.5 billion years old. What caused the rings to appear in the first place? Well, there are a few theories. One of them suggests the rings could have formed when small, icy moons in orbit around Saturn collided. Perhaps their own orbits were messed up by a gravitational tug from a passing asteroid or comet. Who knows what humans might end up looking like in the future? It's unlikely we'll see any major changes in our lifetime. But let's take a journey to the future and ponder what we might evolve into. Will we become cyborgs with all sorts of cool machine implants? Or maybe we'll become a hybrid species of biological and artificial beings. To understand our future evolution, we gotta take a peek at our past. A million years ago, Homo sapiens didn't even exist. There were a few other similar species though, like the Neanderthal. Fast forward to today, and humans have become taller and sturdier. Maybe in the future we'll become smaller to conserve energy as it's predicted that our planet will get more crowded. Speaking of crowded planets, living in these new conditions means we have to adapt and fast. We're constantly interacting with lots of people and remembering names is becoming a crucial skill. Luckily, technology might help us out with brain implants that will improve our memory. In the future, we might also have more noticeable technologies as part of our appearance. Imagine having an artificial eye with a camera that can read different frequencies of light. While predicting a million years into the future is pure speculation, 
we can use bioinformatics to make some predictions about the immediate future. Demographic trends suggest that urban areas will become more genetically diverse, while rural areas will become less diverse. And what about space? If we end up colonizing Mars, our bodies could change due to lower gravity. Maybe we'll have longer arms and legs, or even insulating body hair like our Neanderthal cousins. In the future, our moon is also going to witness some dramatic changes. We'll miss these ones too. In about 5 billion years, things are going to get really interesting in this corner of the universe. For now, the sun is chilling in its main sequence phase, just burning hydrogen like nobody's business. In the future, during the red giant phase, the sun is going to puff up like a balloon until its atmosphere reaches out and engulfs our beloved Earth and Moon. Our natural satellite, which is already moving away from Earth, is going to get warped around the sun's influence. Its orbit will get all wonky, and it'll end up closer to Earth during the new moon phase than during the full moon. And that's not even the worst part. If left alone, the moon would keep on moving away from Earth until it'll need almost 50 days to orbit us. As the sun continues with its own journey, its atmosphere will drag on the moon and cause its orbit to decay. Eventually, the moon will get torn apart into a stunning ring of debris circling Earth. We're talking about all its mountains, craters, and even the footprints and flags we left there, all scattered throughout the debris field. There's a chance the sun will shed enough mass to spare Earth and the moon from total annihilation. Or if we're really lucky, the sun will lose 20% of its mass and we'll be safe and sound. It's all just theory right now, we haven't seen a red giant star during this phase. The universe itself might go completely dark one day too. Scientists can't predict it with absolute certainty, but they can make some educated guesses. Right now, our universe is 13.77 billion years old, and it's still churning out new stars left and right. It's said that eventually, after about 1 trillion years, the last star will be born. That final star will be a little guy, a red dwarf, just a fraction the size of our sun. These stars are champs at living long lives, slowly sipping on hydrogen to keep their fusion reactions going. But even they can't last forever. Fast forward about 100 trillion years and the last light will go out. The universe will be dark and lonely, but thankfully we won't be here to watch it all fade away. You're dozing off in your window seat on a plane. It's getting dark since it's almost 11 p.m. Suddenly, something wakes you up. You glance out of the window and see a really strange phenomenon, something that creeps you out. There are bright red huge flashes illuminating the sky at a distance. They resemble some nightmarish jellyfish. Those are sprites, also called red sprites due to their color. They're also known as cloud to space lightning. These varied visual shapes flickering in the night sky are large-scale electric discharges, which is a clever word for a lightning strike. They occur high above thunderstorm clouds at altitudes of 30 to 56 miles. That's why you can see them so well from your plane window. The coolest thing about sprites is that they're positively charged lightning. This is a very rare type that makes up a mere 5% of all lightning strikes. People first spotted this phenomenon in 1886, and it was first photographed in 1989. In 2018, the legendary Niagara Falls, located at the border between New York State and Ontario, Canada, managed to surprise everyone. Tourists who came to admire the roaring waters found the falls frozen. Well, the waterfalls weren't frozen per se. This is impossible for a mass of flowing water that huge but microscopic water droplets, as well as the mist, formed a crust of ice over the rushing water. It created an illusion that Niagara Falls was frozen all over. In reality, the water kept flowing beneath the ice. Imagine ponds filled with ice-cold water and covered with ice. Easy, huh? And now picture dozens of alligator snouts that are poking out of the ponds, still and frozen in ice. 
That's what you'd seen if you had visited the swamps of North Carolina at the beginning of 2018. Despite this terrifying picture, the animals were very much alive. That was a very special crocodile way to survive abnormally cold weather. Since their nostrils were above water, the animals could breathe. Meanwhile, their bodies were in a hibernation-like state. It allowed the animals to conserve energy and stay warm. In the winter of 2018, the inhabitants of the Sahara Desert, one of the driest and hottest places on the planet, woke up to discover a thick layer of snow covering the sand. In some places, its depth reached a staggering 15 inches. Meteorologists had an explanation for this exciting phenomenon. They said that cold pools of air combined with the precipitation of the most recent storm resulted in snowfall instead of rain. It happened in June 2009. People in some areas in Japan left their homes after a heavy downpour, only to find fish, frogs, and tadpoles everywhere. Fields, roads, lawns, and house roofs were littered with these creatures. One man even found 13 carp on and around his truck. No one knows for sure where this bizarre rain came from, but the most popular theory is that a powerful water spout picked up the animals. Then it carried them through the upper atmosphere and dropped them on the unsuspecting people below. In Australia, it sometimes rains spiders. That's because these creatures can balloon. It's a highly unusual way of traveling. A spider climbs to the very top of a tall tree or shrub, and then it spins several strands of silk, which then help the spider to be carried away by the wind. It's not easy to spot ballooning spiders, but sometimes when the weather is especially damp and unpleasant, mass ballooning occurs. Millions of spiders set off on a journey to find another place with better conditions. It may look as if it's snowing outside, but no, those are spiders drifting down to the ground. The world's longest lightning storms happen in Venezuela and can last for nine hours per day. The heart of the storm is over Lake Maracaibo, and the clouds tower way higher than your regular thunderstorm clouds. This natural phenomenon, also known as Catatumbo lightning, occurs during 140 to 160 nights a year and can produce up to 28 lightning strikes per minute. You've probably heard how they say that lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. Well, Catatumbo lightning seems not to know about this rule. At least, it doesn't prevent storm clouds from gathering in the very same place year after year. Volcanic tornadoes are possibly one of the most terrifying natural phenomena. When a volcano erupts, it spews red-hot rock and ash high into the atmosphere. And solid lava pieces and hot gases travel down the volcano's slope. When this flow is moving down, some of the trapped gases begin to rise and spin at the same time. They get squeezed by the surrounding air, which makes them spin faster and faster. That's how a volcanic tornado gets born. Luckily, this phenomenon has a very short lifespan. Even though the island of Newfoundland in Canada can't be called the warmest place on Earth, it's still not that cold. But imagine having to shovel snow in front of your house just several days before your summer vacation. Well, that's exactly what happened on the island in June 2018. A cold storm that came from the coast of Newfoundland covered several regions of the islands with a two-inch layer of snow. On top of that, the temperature broke all the records as well. During a Newfoundland summer, it's about 66 degrees on average and 90 degrees on a very hot day. But that infamous June impressed people with only 37 degrees Fahrenheit in the morning. Brr. Morning glory clouds are extremely rare. They look like massive tubes stretching across the sky. They can snake for more than 600 miles, sitting relatively low. Most researchers agree that these clouds appear when an updraft squeezes through the cloud. This creates the signature rolling appearance. The cool air at the back of the cloud makes it sink downward. The best but not the only place to see the morning glory is Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria. If you decide to travel there to see these clouds, choose a period from late September to early November. On March 19, 2018, the inhabitants of Alabama saw huge chunks of ice falling from the sky. 
It was the infamous hailstorm of Alabama which caused millions of dollars worth of damage. After the hailstorm, the place looked ruined. Broken shop windows, smashed car windshields, broken billboards, and holes in the roofs. But what made researchers really excited was a hailstone found near the town of Cullman, Alabama. This softball-sized monster was more than five inches across, setting a new state record. In 2012, the sky over Dorset, England turned first ominously dark, then yellow. After that, blue gelatinous balls started to fall to the ground. A local man was walking to his garage when he spotted something unusually bright among whitish hailstones. When researchers examined this jelly rain, they found out that the balls were made of the substance used in diapers or potting soil. It's used to absorb liquid. It's still unclear whether the balls fell from the sky or maybe the melting ice made a few already existing crystals expand in the blink of an eye. In March 2018, people in northern Nevada could see the rarest and most bizarre cloud ever, a horseshoe cloud. It sure looks bizarre and kind of scary. But meteorologists know that this interestingly shaped vortex happens when a flat cloud travels over a column of warm, rising air. This air creates the shape and adds some spin to the cloud's movements. Such clouds are very fleeting and usually last for only several minutes. Cylindrical snow donuts occur when a wind gust decides to play snowballs. It starts to roll some snow across a snowy area. If it was a real snowball, it would eventually become too heavy for the wind to move. But the center of a snow donut is hollowed out. This happens because its inner layer is too thin and gets blown away when the donut is formed. This makes it lighter than a regular snowball. That's why it also rolls further. Unfortunately, you can't just go and find snow donuts. They're rare because they appear in very precise conditions. About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort Dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Veritafort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. 
That is how the Pingualua crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario. But the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds. But no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire. Almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back, and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada, around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth-largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space, and its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. 
The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater. Planet Earth is full of wondrous phenomena. I mean, can you imagine going for a midnight swim and suddenly finding yourself surrounded by a glowing blue haze? As if there were huge pillars of light coming out of the seabed directly toward the surface. This experience is rare, but it sure is magical. This chemical reaction is known as bioluminescence, and it can happen in different situations. One example is when tiny algae organisms migrate closer to the seashore. When these algaes are disturbed, ooh, they try to defend themselves by glowing, and just happens to create the most beautiful spectacle. There's another place in the world where you can see a similar thing, but it's caused by a different creature. This place is in New Zealand. Hidden deep within the country's caves live glowworms. They're the larvae of medium-sized narrow beetles that happen to be luminescent. If you're lucky enough to tour these caves, you'll feel like floating inside an underground galaxy. Recently, a video of a super-rare phenomenon started circulating on the web. Take a quick look at it and see if you can make out what it is. Okay, it looks like a river, right? But it doesn't look as if any water is flowing there. When the Iraqis first saw this happening, they didn't know what it was, so they just called it the Sand River. It sure was a good guess, but a flowing river of sand would be something too out of this world to be true. It turns out that what these people saw was more or less an optical illusion. It's not sand, but it's not exactly water either. Here's what happened. In arid environments, it's not so uncommon for hail to fall. And in the case of Sand River, what we actually see is thousands and thousands of floating hailstones. Oh, and if you don't know what hail is, it's frozen rain that pours down in the form of small pebbles of ice. That would be something to see. Say you're driving through the countryside and suddenly spot a mushroom-shaped cloud. Uh-oh. Or maybe it's a spaceship of another civilization. You don't quite know what it is, but you do realize that it's huge. Should you continue driving toward it? Or should you turn around and drive in the other direction? Well, you should know that a cloud like this indicates a huge thunderstorm is happening inside. And not just a storm, but a mesocyclone. A mesocyclone is a rotating updraft that can span several miles. It's usually accompanied by torrential rains and strong winds. So, if I were you, I'd turn that car around and head in the opposite direction. Whew. You know Thor? I guess he might live inside this next natural phenomenon. Sometimes, when a volcano erupts, this process can be accompanied by huge thunderbolts. Scientists often refer to it as volcanic lightning. They're still debating why this thing occurs. One of their guesses is that when a volcano erupts, it projects positively charged debris into the atmosphere. These charges then react with the already present negative charges, which can produce a bolt of lightning. Cool, huh? The first time anyone witnessed something like this was during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE. Nah, it wasn't me. But here I am wondering, were there or were there not any sightings of Thor? Hey, sometimes when I work out too much, I get Thor. <clears throat> now, all the way down in Senegal, Africa, we'll witness another unbelievable sight. Some 18 miles north of Dakar, the country's capital, there is a unique lake. Arriving there, you might imagine you're walking out of a spaceship and stepping on an unknown planet. After all, have you ever seen real-life pink water before? Lake Retba, or Lac Rose, as the locals call it, has become internationally famous for being vivid pink. And yes, you can swim there if you'd like to. But you should know that the water there is extremely salty. Lake Redba is known to be one of the world's saltiest lakes, with a saline level of over 40%. And in case you're wondering why the water is pink, I assure you this has nothing to do with otherworldly factors. It's actually due to high levels of salt. The algae, Dunaliella salina, is responsible for the pink hue. These algae produce the red pigment that absorbs sunlight, giving the lake its striking pink color. But if you'd like to see the lake at its brightest, you should go there during the dry season. 
between November and June. During other months, rainwater dilutes the pigment, and the color of the lake becomes less distinct. Lake Retba has turned into a famous international attraction recently because who wouldn't love a picture of them swimming in the pink water? You might have heard of the Aurora Borealis, aka the Northern Lights. This phenomenon has continued to mesmerize scientists and tourists alike ever since it was witnessed for the first time. Now to see it, you have to be pretty lucky. You'll need to travel to the extreme north or south points of our planet. And even then, you'll have to hunt this phenomenon down and hope the sky will put on a show for you. The aurora borealis is an extremely rare phenomenon. And although these greenish lights look delicate, they're actually the fruit of a rather rough event. This spectacular light show occurs when energized particles from the sun slam into Earth's upper atmosphere. But it sure is a sight to behold, isn't it? Can you imagine a hill that never stops burning? Located in the Arctic region of Canada, the so-called smoking hills are an unmatched sight on our planet. And here, things get a little science fiction-y, since some of the minerals found in these hills have only been discovered outside Earth, on the surface of Mars. The ground of the smoking hills has been releasing smoke for at least a couple hundred years, non-stop. Explorers thought the area was home to an active volcano, but that wasn't the case. As science explains, the soil in the area is formed by sulfur and coal. And when these elements get in contact with oxygen, they spontaneously ignite, releasing constant smoke. I just want to warn you, don't get any touristy ideas. The environment is extremely hostile to people. The smoke is toxic, and its temperatures are dangerously high. So let's move on before smoke gets in our eyes. Hey, there's a song there! Have you ever heard of something called a natural snowball? This can be proof that nature is really perfect. In 2016, the beaches of the Gulf of Ah, a bay in the Arctic Ocean, filled up with rows and rows of giant snowballs. Think balls measuring up to 3 feet across. This is a rare yet beautiful phenomenon that happens when smaller pieces of ice end up getting rolled by strong winds and water. The further they roll, the more ice they gather and the more polished this ice becomes. Such snowballs end up as giant, perfectly shaped spheres. They look pretty amazing on their own, but hundreds of them together? Wow, think of it. You could have a snowball fight between giants. There are also some snowballs that turn into huge rolling donuts. This shape occurs only in perfect temperature conditions when the snow is both hard and fluffy. A snowball begins rolling down, gathering more and more snow until, suddenly, its middle part collapses. This way, the snowball acquires its donut shape. Mmm, does it also taste as good as a donut? No. Now, let's say you go for a hike, but instead of blue skies, you see a huge cloud of fog. Now, this may ruin your photo ops, but there's one thing you can hope for. Foggy days are perfect for a phenomenon known as the fog bow. Its other name is the white rainbow. It occurs because of the tiny size of water droplets that form the fog. They're even smaller than two thousandths of an inch. You know, teeny tiny. So instead of a multicolored rainbow, you get a transparent one with red outer edges and a bluish inner border. Cool. Hey, ever heard of a fire rainbow? Yeah, me neither. How about a circumhorizontal arc? Didn't think so, but just so you know, they're one and the same thing. At first glance, it looks like a painting, or like a rainbow-colored splash in the sky. Despite the name, they have nothing in common with either fire or rain. This phenomenon happens on rare occasions when the sun shines through a particular type of ice cloud formation. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, a specific type of ice crystals and clouds needs to be present for the surface of the Earth to bend light from the Sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. The only difference will be that moon halos are usually white, and sun halos can be rainbow-colored. When visiting regions with high altitudes, you may be one of the lucky people to stumble upon penitentes. They're basically naturally formed ice spikes. For them to be formed, they need a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor rather than melting it into water. And that's why these blades of snow and ice start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. As cute as they may be, they can end up as tall as 15 feet. 
Now, what happens when small, individual droplets of lava meet the wind? Pele's hair, basically. Let me explain. The word Pele comes from an ancient Hawaiian symbol for volcanoes. Whenever the wind picks up little drops of lava, it stretches them into hair-like strands, similar to the process of glass wire creation. These delicate strands can stretch as far as 6 feet. On rare occasions, it can rain without any clouds. But does it really? Let's look at the science behind this rare phenomenon. It's sometimes called a sun shower, just because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. Let's be clear, though. There is no way rain can ever come down directly from a star. Rain clouds are at a bit of a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Add a little wind to blow the rain in your direction, and ta-da! You get sun showers. Located in Bolivia is a place called Salar de Uni. It's the largest salt flat in the world. It's also the home of half of the world's lithium, which is a crucial component for making batteries. But what else is so special about this place? Well, whenever the rain season comes, it turns this piece of flat land into a perfectly reflective mirror lake. What comes to your mind when you hear about the Blood Falls? A horror movie? (laughs) Well, they are merely a series of waterfalls located in one of the driest regions of Antarctica. They emerge from an underground lake filled with a special kind of bacteria. These little organisms use sulfates as fuel instead of sugars, which makes them very intriguing for scientists. The water contained in this lake is so full of iron that it basically just rusts when it meets the air. Hence, the reddish color of the waterfall, which also gives it its trademark name. Okay, we all know the song, but it's not really made up. There is actually such a thing called a desert rose. It's not a plant, though, but a unique form of the mineral gypsum. It develops in dry, sandy places that can occasionally flood. This constant switching between a wet and dry environment lets the gypsum crystals emerge between grains of sand, trapping them and forming a rose-like shape. Ever heard of the Eye of Sahara? Scientists are still trying to figure out how it was formed. You can only see it if you fly above it, but it's basically a naturally formed dome that dates back to approximately 100 million years ago. And no, I wasn't around then. It has a rough diameter of 25 miles and consists of a bunch of concentric rings. The biggest one, or the central area, measures about 19 miles in diameter. Astronauts were some of the first people to notice it, and it's been studied ever since. In fact, even to this day, when landing in Florida, they know they're almost home when they see the Eye of Sahara. One of the most beautifully colored trees in the world is located in the Philippines and Indonesia. It's called the rainbow eucalyptus. It got its name because of its bark that switches colors and peels away as the tree ages. The bright green bark is the youngest, as it contains a substance called chlorophyll, usually found in leaves. It then switches to purple and then to the color red. And finally, it turns brown as it grows and loses the chlorophyll. Now, don't be tricked into thinking that's a whole forest. It's one single tree. And no, it's not some sort of optical illusion either. Let me explain. Underneath that soil, there is a complex network of roots that connects around 47,000 tree-like shapes you see above the ground. It's called the quaking aspen. Some of these trees are among the oldest and largest organisms in the world. Now, here's a good destination for all travelers, or maybe not so good after all. The most lightning-stricken area in the world, according to recent data released by NASA, is Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. Out of all the days in a year, 300 of them feature thunderstorms in this location. What makes this area so unique, though, that storms happen so often? Well, it's because where cool mountain air meets the warm, moist breeze and generates electricity over the lake. The Eternal Flame Falls are located in upstate New York, near the Canadian border. In this region, there is a tiny waterfall with a big secret, a spark about 8 inches tall. Turns out there's a natural gas seat that provides fuel to the flame behind the waterfall. The waterfall provides enough coverage so that it stays lit pretty much every time. 
Hikers do enjoy to relight it if they see that it's been blown out. This phenomenon is actually quite common, but this one gained more popularity because it is younger than most. And it looks very good in pictures, let's be honest. I've heard of yellow sand, white sand, and even black sand here or there. But I've never heard of green beaches until now. Papacolia, also known as Green Sand Beach, is located in Hawaii and is one of the few beaches in the world that features green sand. The unique coloring comes from olivine rock that was formed when a nearby volcano erupted. Actually, in Hawaii, all the volcanoes are nearby. Move over green sands because some of the other beaches around the world can even glow at night. And it's completely natural. The culprit? A little thing called photoplankton, or microalgae, as they're sometimes called. They're basically little plants that contain chlorophyll and need sunlight in order to live and grow. Most photoplankton kinds are able to float in the upper part of the ocean, where the sunlight can still reach them beneath the water. When the photoplankton gets agitated by the movement of waves and currents, they emit light, which looks like some glow during the night. These special microorganisms are found on beaches in a lot of places around the world, such as the Maldives, Puerto Rico, and the Everglades. At the base of a mountain located just outside of Afton, Wyoming, is a little river called the Intermittent Spring. There are only three of this kind in the whole world, but what makes this little string of water so mysterious? Well, the fact that it starts and stops every few minutes. Scientists have yet to pinpoint precisely why this happens. They speculate that it's basically just a siphon effect that happens deep within the ground that causes the river to just start and stop so often. Should you ever be interested in checking it out, be sure to do so in the late summer, as that's when the intermittent spring is most active. Do you see the irony here? You can only see the spring in the summer? Okay, I'm done. Floods, tornadoes, tsunamis, hurricanes, yikes. All these natural disasters can get extremely dangerous, but we're kind of familiar with them. But how about a natural disaster that has never happened before, but could occur any moment now? It might be a super eruption. That's what happens when a super volcano erupts. You might know that Yellowstone Park is located on top of a super volcano. The last massive eruption there happened about 664,000 years ago, and the one before that, approximately 1.3 million years ago. If we do the math, we'll understand that the next eruption might be due anytime soon. There's no strong evidence that the supervolcano is waking up or preparing for an eruption, but what would it be like if it did happen? Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes would become more frequent and more powerful in the area. Not long before the eruption, the growing pressure would push up the ground over the volcano, creating a dome. Narrow cracks would open along the edges of this dome. The magma would then start rising toward the surface, and then the eruption would kick off. A massive column of lava and ash would shoot up into the air to a height of over 16 miles. The volcano would keep pumping ash for days on end. The air in that area would heat up to 570 degrees Fahrenheit. For all living creatures, ash fallout would be one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Buildings and trees would start collapsing under the weight of this dense substance. It would only take a couple of days for a 10-foot layer of ash to cover the territory of about 50 miles around the center of the eruption. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world would start to drop. The eruption would also be rich in sulfur, and this element is an effective sunblocker. That's why it would soon get so cold that there would be no summer in the whole world for the next several years. The monsoon seasons would change. It would be hard for animals to find food and clean water. Well now, how about a gamma ray burst? You don't stumble across this kind of radiation in your everyday life. A gamma ray burst occurs when two neutron stars collide. The collapse of a massive star can produce it too. Gamma rays could present a serious danger to Earth. If a gamma ray burst happened close to our home planet, it could rip our ozone layer away. After that, we would be left unprotected from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. 
Plus, gamma rays could also produce ground ozone. This kind of ozone could seep into the ocean since it's water-soluble, and that would lead to a mass extinction of marine life. Plants wouldn't survive this disaster either. Now, come to think of it, giant sinkholes could swallow entire communities. One of such sinkholes opened up in the city of New York. It pulled a parked van into the earth. That happened in the summer of 2022. And it wasn't the only sinkhole to appear in that area. Local inhabitants reported about 4,000 sinkholes all over the city. This kind of problem is also very common in Florida, and it's much more serious than it may sound. Sinkholes open all of a sudden, pulling down everything and everyone that happens to be nearby. Sinkholes appear all over the world, which makes them a global problem. They're totally unpredictable and form without warning. Luckily, experts know what causes them. In some areas, there are vast areas of groundwater. But during droughts, this water dries up. This creates large empty caverns, and after heavy rains, the surface over such a cavern can collapse, creating a sinkhole within minutes. Now, what if we came across a wandering black hole? You might know that a black hole is a region in space where gravity is so powerful that not even light can escape its clutches. Luckily, the nearest one to us is 1,500 light-years away. Nothing to worry about, right? Until you find out about wandering black holes. Now, things get definitely way creepier. If such a black hole entered the solar system, Earth would be doomed. We wouldn't stand a chance against this space monster. In 2012, 13 wandering black holes were spotted not so far away from our planet. But worry not, not far away, in space terms, means around 1 billion light years away. So we've got some time left. Plus, the possibility of such a disaster is very, very low. Another natural disaster we haven't experienced yet is a mega flood. It's never happened before, but the changes in climate do make for a risky potential. It could start, let's say, in California. This state experienced some really bad flooding in the past. One of such floods stretched up to 60 miles across and 300 miles long. If a similar disaster happened these days, it would cause $1 trillion worth of damage. It would also uproot millions of people. Now, let's talk about a hypercane. Judging from the name, this natural disaster might get extreme. A hypercane is a theoretical hurricane of unsurpassed power. It would occur if the ocean became overheated as a result of climate change, or because of a massive volcanic eruption. In any case, these conditions could create a hurricane that would stretch way beyond the lower stratosphere. And as you may guess, regular hurricanes don't do that. The hypercane speed would reach 500 miles per hour. The pressure inside would be low enough not to let the hypercane to wear out as quickly as other hurricanes. The hypercane could last for weeks on end. But the worst thing? It could damage or even destroy part of Earth's ozone layer. And the hole could be the size of the entire North American continent. Now, this disaster did happen before. About 66 million years ago, I bet you know what I'm hinting at. Yep, that very meteor that supposedly wiped out dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. This 7-mile-wide space visitor was traveling at 67,000 miles per hour. As a result of the collision, 75% of all life on the planet disappeared, and winter rained on Earth for 18 months. Want to know a secret? Meteors strike Earth all the time. Even more of them barely miss our planet. But it's also very hard to predict meteor strikes. Scientists miss a lot of them until they just nearly miss us. That's why experts are working on an early warning system that could prevent disasters. It could make meteor impacts less catastrophic, or at least allow people time to evacuate. It could also be our very own sun that would be responsible for another natural disaster. I'm talking about a massive solar flare. On the scale of damage to society, few catastrophes can compare to this event. It wouldn't destroy buildings like a tsunami or an earthquake. 
Neither would it end lives in the same way a supervolcano or meteor would. But it would cripple our entire way of life by destroying the whole electronic infrastructure of Earth. The cost of this disaster would reach trillions of dollars. It'd cause other infrastructures to fail. Communication, medicine, transportation, banking systems. Those would tumble like dominoes. And it would be incredibly hard to recover them. Earth would be left without electricity for years. There would be no electric light, no computers, no phones. Water supply systems would be out of order. There would be no food in supermarkets. There would be no electricity. And people wouldn't be able to reboot the already broken power grids. In 1859, people all over the world woke up in the middle of the night. It was as light as during the day. The skies were illuminated with auroras, red, green, purple. They appeared even in the regions where no one had seen them before, like the Bahamas, Jamaica, or Hawaii. Telegraphs got electrically charged, even though they were disconnected. In many areas, fires started. That was when technology barely existed. But imagine the avalanche of problems a solar flare could cause today. In Russia, on the shores of the Baltic Sea, there's an enigmatic national park. The Dancing Forest is a place that no scientist has managed to explain so far. The pine trees of the forest are all crooked and twisted into loops and spirals. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted in order to make the sand dune in that area more stable. One theory is that it's the unstable sand that made the trees twist in such a way. Other theories for the crooked trees are strong winds, or even supernatural powers. Some people say the forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet, twisting the trees. Local legend says that if a person climbs through one of the rings of a tree, it'll add an extra year to this person's life, or they'll be granted a wish. I like that one. Speaking of bizarre trees, and I was, one grows in the region of Piedmont, Italy. There, a cherry tree grows on the top of a mulberry tree. The strange thing is that both trees are perfectly healthy. A continuous storm at Saturn's North Pole has an odd shape, a hexagon. This is probably because of the gradient of the winds. The total length of this cloud pattern is 9,000 miles, which is about 1,200 miles longer than the Earth's diameter. The hexagon has been observed for many years, but it gets even more mysterious because it changes color too. It used to be turquoise, but it has recently shifted to a golden color. The reason for the color change is that the pole gets exposed to sunlight as the seasons change. Now, rain isn't unusual for Oakville, Washington. However, this one still doesn't have any solid scientific explanation. Instead of common raindrops, People watch translucent jelly-like blobs fall from the skies. These blobs covered about 20 square miles. Those who got really close to the rain experienced flu-like symptoms. What were the blobs? Researchers claim that the blobs contain human white blood cells. Later tests showed no presence of nuclei. Some people claim the blobs might have been evaporated jellyfish resulting in rain, or maybe even waste from a commercial plane. Walking rocks, also known as sailing rocks, move across the Death Valley National Park in California without any external intervention, leaving long trails in the dirt and sand along their way. Various time-lapse footages of the moving rocks have been taken. Scientists even installed GPS navigators on some of the rocks, and it showed that the rocks move at a considerable speed. Some researchers believe that the movement is due to thin sheets of ice that form overnight at freezing temperatures in the valley, letting the rocks move until it melts during the day. Or there was a Rolling Stones concert. Nah. The Batagaika crater in Siberia looks like a doorway to the underworld. It's about a half mile long and over 280 feet deep, but it never stops growing. As it gets deeper, it exposes more underground layers. The layers show what our planet looked like thousands of years ago, as the slumps reveal the used-to-be climates. The crater appeared back in the 60s, and it all started with rapid deforestation. Trees no longer cast shade on the ground, and it got hotter. The permafrost melted, 
resulting in the crater formation. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals wild since the 1990s. The low-frequency hum deprives people of sleep and depletes their energy. Even though scientists have tried to find the source of the hum, they still haven't pinpointed its origin. Different variations of the hum have also been heard in the UK, Australia, Canada, and other areas of the US. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. The hums have been blamed on mechanical devices, multiple disturbances of auditory systems, and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was blamed on toadfish. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are mysterious rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. There's a lot of debate about why these fungi form a nearly perfect circle. Some superstitions claim that fairy dances would burn the ground, causing mushrooms to rapidly grow. In Costa Rica, there's an assortment of about 300 spherical stone balls. Locals call them las bolas, which is simply the balls in English. These stones have an almost perfect round shape. Some of them are huge, weighing up to 16 tons each. They're also made of different materials – gabbro, limestone, and sandstone. They're considered to have been put in straight lines in front of the chief's houses, but there's no precise information of their origin. Some myths claim that these stones originated in Atlantis. Mm. If you ever travel to the Mekong River in late October, you have a chance of seeing glowing balls rising from the water and beelining up into the air. Locals call these glowing balls the Naga fireballs. The size of the lights vary. The reddish balls can be as tiny as a spark and as large as a basketball. There can be dozens to thousands of balls a night. Scientists don't have any solid explanation for why it happens, but it could be due to flammable gases released by the marshy environment. Some superstitious locals are sure it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Great balls of fire! In Minnesota, on the north shore of Lake Superior, there's a park known for the Devil's Kettle. This is a waterfall that splits in two. One part of the river continues, while the other part disappears into a hole in the ground. Whatever object you throw into the Devil's Kettle won't reappear. Scientists still haven't fully explained where the water that drops into the hole goes. Devil's Kettle is considered to be unsafe for people because it's nearly impossible to trace the flow. Yeah, not a place to go tubing. Grunions are fish known for their bizarre mating ritual. The females climb out of the water and onto the shore. They dig their tails into the sand in order to lay eggs. The legs stay hidden in the sand, waiting. Ten days later, the high tide comes, washing the newly hatched young to the sea. Scientists still can't give any solid explanation for this way of breeding. People who live in rural central Norway over the Hestalen Valley can often witness floating lights of white, yellow, and red cross the sky. The lights appear both at day and night, and once back in the 80s, they were spotted 15 to 20 times in a single week. The Hestalen lights can last just a few seconds, but sometimes they can last more than an hour. The lights move, seeming to float or even sway around. Some scientists believe that the reason for these lights is due to ionized iron dust. Others say it's combustion that includes sodium, oxygen, and hydrogen. Many people claim they're just misidentified aircrafts. Yellowstone Park has a famous boiling lake, but it's not the world's only place of boiling water. Deep in the Amazon, there's the 4-mile Chanay Tempishka River that's always hot. The name means boiled by the sun. Well, it's not exactly boiling, but it can reach 196 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to cook pasta. Ooh, let's try that. The lowest temperature in these waters is about 113 degrees. This river still can't be scientifically explained because it would require close proximity to a volcano for the water to reach such temperatures. However, the closest volcano is 400 miles away. But there could be a fault between the Earth that could explain this phenomenon. In western Venezuela, locals living close to the Catatumbo River aren't afraid of lightning, 
because they see it almost every single night. It starts at around 7 o'clock and doesn't stop until dawn. The everlasting Catatumbo lightning did once stop for a few months, from January to March 2010. It was probably due to drought, or maybe the charge ran out. In 1991, a scientist suggested that the phenomenon happens because of cold and warm air currents meeting in the area. Another theory is that the lightning could be due to the presence of uranium in the bedrock. Speaking of lightning, I got a bolt! Bye! Rocks rolling down the slopes of a rumbling volcano, pushing other bigger rocks on their way, and eventually tumbling down into the ocean in a humongous cascade causing a wave the height of which the world's never seen before. This is what might happen if the Helena slump of the Hawaiian Big Island falls off into the water. The Kilauea volcano is far from dormant. The latest eruption occurred in 2018. Its eruptions are usually accompanied by earthquakes of different magnitudes. And with each quake, the magma rocks on the slopes of the volcano shift down. These rock formations are called slumps and the Helena slump is the most notorious of them all. In 1868, the shift of this slump caused a tidal wave rising as tall as 60 feet. But what's most troubling is that some 110,000 years ago, a landslide here led to one of the most powerful earthquakes ever, which in turn led to a mega tsunami of over a thousand feet in height. Scientists are worried that such an event may repeat in the future. If that happens, the wave might engulf the whole of Hawaii and easily reach both North and South American coasts. Geologists are quick to reassure, though, that a landslide like this is unlikely to occur anytime soon. It's just too early for that. But when it finally does, the consequences will be catastrophic. Have a nice day! Yellowstone National Park in the western USA is world-famous for its dazzling views, and especially the colorful Grand Prismatic Spring at its very heart. But we should all stay aware that Yellowstone is, first and foremost, an enormous caldera, basically a slumbering supervolcano. The difference between a regular volcano, like Kilauea from earlier, and a supervolcano is that the latter is thousands of times more powerful. Imagine an eruption spewing tons of huge rock and rivers of hot lava, pumping out clouds of ash that make countries stop air travel for weeks. And now multiply all of this by a thousand. This is what a Yellowstone eruption would look like. At first, a huge area in the middle of the national park would shake, crumble, and then blast upwards in a megaton explosion. Lava flows and magma rocks would cover the area of about 40 square miles, roughly half of Washington, D.C. But the greatest danger is the volcanic ash. The ashen plume would rise miles above and get carried by the wind in every direction. Since the eruption would be far from ordinary, the spread and damage would also be much greater than usual. The ash is thick and heavy, so it would cover a vast area in a blanket, destroying crops and even buildings. Worse still, it would spread in the air and block out the sun leading to a drastic drop in temperature and an artificial winter. Even regular volcanoes can lower temperatures worldwide by a few degrees. A supervolcano may potentially cause a new ice age. Luckily, the chances of Yellowstone supervolcano erupting in the near future, or at all, are extremely low. There have been only three of those in the history of Earth, and there's no evidence such a disaster should repeat. Scientists estimate the probability at 0.00014%, which is lower than the chances of an asteroid wiping us all out. Speaking of which… If dinosaurs could talk, and were at least still alive for that matter, they'd tell you that asteroid threat is as real as it gets. Scientists at NASA say they've tracked 90% of all near-Earth asteroids of significant size, and none of them are a matter of any concern. But there are still the other 10% in the great unknown. What's more, asteroids can change their line of flight because of the pull of other celestial bodies and eventually turn our way. Lucky us! Now, if an asteroid big enough, like a mile across, hits the Earth, it will first cause an explosion powerful enough to erase a dozen big cities in a matter of seconds. Then the impact will raise a cloud of dust and debris that will block out the sun, just like the ash cloud from a volcano, and cause a centuries-long winter on the whole planet. But even if it falls into the ocean, which is more likely, 
A resulting wave will rise several miles high, washing coastal cities off the face of the planet. But at least there won't be a new ice age. Although scientists are pretty sure there's no such threat in the near future, it can't be ruled out completely, and humanity needs at least five years to prepare for this event. If a big near-Earth asteroid suddenly changes its course and turns right toward our planet, we won't stand a chance against it. Disaster movie, anyone? A much more probable calamity, though, rests right beneath our feet. It's the San Andreas Fault in California. The fault has been ready for rupture for years now. And scientists estimate that an earthquake along this line is likely to occur in the next three decades. And when it happens, it won't be nice. They expect a magnitude of 8.0, which is comparable to some of the most devastating quakes in history. It's all the more dangerous since California is home to some of the most populated cities in the western US, including Los Angeles and San Francisco. High-rise buildings are common there, and they're particularly vulnerable against underground shakes. The San Andreas earthquake might cause a whole lot of damage both to cities and countryside. In the worst-case scenario, the ground might break apart, destroying buildings, farms, and changing the landscape altogether. Still, scientists believe that the probability of such a quake is only 7% for the next 30 years. So there's a rather big chance, um, 93%, that we'll never see that in our lifetime. Yet, there's another earthquake hazard not so far away from the previous one. The mega thrust in Chile. The country sits right above the subduction zone, an area where two tectonic plates meet and go one beneath the other. At the place of their meeting, stress has accumulated because of their continuous movement, and once that strain is too much, a major earthquake occurs. Chile has experienced a lot of quakes in the recent years, and scientists are worried those might be preparing the area for a really big one. They believe a great earthquake is due to happen before the end of the century, and it might be devastating to the coastal area. Even smaller quakes caused tsunamis that flooded the west coast, and a huge one like that is likely to raise a wave of incredible height. On the bright side, Chile now knows to prepare in advance for the coming natural disasters. And geologists are pretty sure people will be able to evacuate before the earthquake strikes. In September of 1859, astronomer Richard Carrington was looking at the sun and suddenly saw a bright flare on its surface. He made a note of it in his records, but only realized how important it was a couple of days later. The energy from that flare reached Earth and struck it directly causing northern lights to appear above Cuba and burning telegraph lines all around the world. This was dubbed the Carrington Event, and it was a solar storm. Such storms hit the Earth fairly often, but none of them were so powerful as the Carrington Event, neither before nor after. But in 2012, astronomers registered a similar solar flare whose energy nearly hit our planet once again. If it had been just a week earlier, we'd have been in big trouble. Today, humanity relies on electricity in almost every aspect of life, and a powerful solar storm would mess with the electromagnetic field of Earth a lot. All electric appliances would either shut down or short-circuit, and huge transformers powering basically everything would go out of order for good. It would take years to repair them, and the cost of such a massive blackout would count in trillions of dollars. The worst of it is that science is almost unable to predict solar storms. And even if we could know about them in advance, we'd be powerless to stop them. The flare happens in a matter of seconds, and it takes about 8 minutes for the particles to reach the Earth's atmosphere, causing the disturbance. The power outage would come a bit later, in a day or so, when a massive cloud of plasma gets to our planet. At the moment, there's no protection against solar flares. And the chances of one powerful enough to cut all of our electricity in the next few years are quite high, about 12%. The only good thing about all this is that we now know of such a possibility and can at least prepare in advance. Hey, don't forget to pack some underwear and socks. You'll always need those. Now, have you ever wondered about the longest time it rained nonstop? Even an hour of rain could be a big deal if you're hanging out in a dry spot like the Atacama Desert in South America. It can set a record for that place. But in super rainy spots like the Amazon rainforest, having 40 days of rain in a row might not even turn heads. 
Interestingly, we only have rainfall records where people live and keep track. Many towns and cities skip the whole rain data collection thing. Plus, there are so many places on Earth where nobody lives, like rainforests or the open ocean. So our rainfall knowledge is a bit patchy. Now, if we were to talk about records, Hawaii has a couple. People there have some seriously long rainy days, especially on islands where winds come from the mountains. From 1939 to 40, they recorded 331 days in a row with measurable rainfall. If you're a person who likes to watch the rain at home with a cup of tea, this might sound ideal to you. But we need to see the sun at least occasionally. Getting some sun is good for your body and soul. Obviously, you get vitamin D. Just 5 to 15 minutes of sunlight a few times a week can make a real difference. And uh, have you ever heard the phrase, sunny disposition? Researchers found that people feel down when there's not much sun around. Sunny days make us happier. Sunshine boosts your serotonin, which fights off bad moods. That sunny serotonin isn't just for your mood, it also helps you sleep. And it's also a heart assistant. When the sun hits your skin, your body releases something called nitric oxide, which chills out your blood pressure. Healthy blood pressure means a healthier heart. Now, go tell that to the people who had to go through 881 consecutive days of rain. Yeah, the record was set almost three full years of rain. This happened from 1913 to 1916 in Honunumaki, Hawaii. It rained like there was no tomorrow, because the region is a tropical rainforest. How do clouds make rain? Well, rain happens when damp air goes up into the sky and gets a bit chilly. As this air cools down, tiny water vapor molecules huddle up, forming super small droplets that look like a fluffy cloud team. Now, inside these clouds, things get playful. The air moving around can sometimes make these droplets bump into one another and get bigger. Then they can turn into ice crystals high up in the clouds where it's chilly. These little ice buddies get heavy enough to take a tumble down, melting in the rain on the way to the ground. Now, there isn't just one type of rain. Raindrops can come from all kinds of storms. Thunderstorms show up, make a splash, and then they're out. They can dump a ton of rain in no time. Other storms, like winter storms, are more laid back. They stick around for days and dish out gentle rain or even snow if it's cold enough. Usually, the weather switches between moods. It's nature's way of balancing things out. After stormy weather, the sun comes out, the air dries up, and we get to enjoy some clear skies. But things can get interesting if you're in a place with mountains near the ocean. When moist air hits the mountains, it's forced to climb over them, creating rainfall lasting sometimes for weeks. What if I told you there was a time on Earth when rain fell continuously for 2 million years and completely reshaped the planet's destiny? At the end of the Permian era, around 234 million years ago, I wasn't around then, but I read about it, the Triassic period began, marked by the onset of an extended period of rainfall. This phenomenon is now called the Carnian Pluvial Event. Well, that's what they decided to call it. Recent studies supported by evidence suggest that it didn't reshape the planet in that sense and that it was triggered by coal combustion. The rain wasn't continuous either. So we just debunked a myth here. Woohoo! Next, we have columnar jointing. This is the fancy term for groove patterns that form in lava flows, sills, dikes, and other rocky stuff. These lava creations come in all shapes and sizes. Most are seen as straight, parallel columns. Some have curves and varying widths. They can be as high as 1,181 inches. I'll save you the map. It's roughly 98 feet. The columns are formed by pressure and the cooling process. As lava becomes cooler, it shrinks and forms cracks. Once a crack starts, the lava moves around. These cracks expand to the surface of the flow. Water sneaks into the cooling lava, making it chill down fast starting from the surface, leaving its mark in those patterns. Devil's Post Pile in California is a must-visit place if you want to see columnar jointing. But hey, they're found all around the world. Let's raise our heads to the sky to see something magical. Fire rainbows, also known as circumhorizontal arcs, look like flames dancing above the clouds. 
To see these eye-catching arcs, you need a special cloud type called cirrus clouds and the sun at least 58 degrees high in the sky. It's a VIP collaboration between sunlight and clouds. Let's break it down further. Take London, for instance. It's around 51 degrees north. Now, sorry Londoners, no fire rainbows for you. Now we move to deep waters to see underwater crop circles. These are giant circular patterns found in 1995 near the shores of southern Japan. Locals were baffled. They dubbed them mystery circles, as if the ocean had a secret talent for sand art. The mystery was solved in 2011. The unlikely artist turned out to be a tiny pufferfish, just 5 inches long. The researchers found out that males were on a mission, spending a solid 7 to 9 days building their circles by swimming in and out and using their fins to carve valleys into the sandy floor. They decorate the peaks of their creations with bits of shells and corals, turning their sandy canvases into masterpieces. Okay, they don't do it for the sake of art. The curious circles have a purpose. The sandy center of the circle serves as a nest. Male swimming moves mix things up, getting sand particles just where they need to be. When a lady pufferfish swims by, the male twirls and dances, swirling sand around. If she is impressed and thinks he is the one, she lays her eggs in the sandy heart of the circle. There you go, another happy ending. Now, let's look at frost flowers. You might have seen thin sheets of ice that look like delicate petals and sometimes pop up from the stems of plants. The ice is about as thick as a credit card. It forms when the weather is cold outside. The soil is damp but not frozen, as well as plant stems. Not all plants produce these frost flowers, and the conditions must be just right. Here's how it happens. The water inside a plant stem gets pulled up from the ground. When it freezes, it expands and cracks the stem vertically. As it hits the chilly air, it turns into ice. As more water gets pulled up through the crack, it keeps pushing out super thin layers of ice. Whether a frost flower looks like a narrow ribbon or a wider one depends on the length of the crack. And the way it curls and shapes itself into these petals is random. Or the reason might lie in the difference in friction along the sides of the crack. These frost flowers are unique and delicate, and they don't last long. They melt or just disappear quickly. To spot them, keep an eye out for tall grass, especially in places that don't get mowed much. Pay attention to purple ironweed, blackberries, and wing stems. Back in 2009, people in Ishikawa, Japan, saw a kind of rain no one's ever seen before. It was raining tadpoles. First reason is that the wind that day was so strong, it lifted and carried all those tadpoles away in no time. The second possible reason is that big birds, such as gulls, just dropped them while they were flying to their nests. Some scientists believe these creatures were hauled off the ground by a water spout and rained down later. By the way, that day, people found not only tadpoles, but also frogs and fish instead of puddles. And yep, yeah, it can be raining worms, too. Some people claim they've seen snake rains. Yay! It was a lovely spring in 1876 in Bath County, Kentucky. Mrs. Crouch was making soap in the yard of her house when she suddenly noticed it started raining meat. It wasn't ground meat. Those were large, 3 inches in diameter chunks of meat falling right on her. Two volunteers were brave enough to try that grizzly-looking meat of unknown origin, and they said it tasted like lamb or deer. Well, they were no foodies. It turned out to be beef. Such cases were registered in Europe, too, and the only logical explanation of meat showers is that buzzards flying over just drop meat pieces they save for lunch. With no luggage, their bodies are lighter and they can fly easier. Wow, I wish it rained donuts on me once. Rains aren't unusual for Oakville, Washington, but this one still doesn't have any solid explanation. Instead of common raindrops, people watch translucent jelly-like blobs falling down from the skies. These little things covered about 20 square miles. Those who got really close to that sort of rain said they felt bad the next day. Scientists studied those blobs and realized they contained human white blood cells. But other tests later showed it wasn't true. Some people think these might have been evaporated jellyfish, which resulted in rain, or it could simply be some waste from a commercial plane. Almost the same thing happened in 2012 in Dorset, UK. During a hailstorm, 
people found gelatin balls together with hailstones. Researchers collected these goopy balls and stored them in a fridge to study later. Turns out it wasn't necessary since the slimy blobs didn't melt at room temperature. No one is sure even now about where the balls came from, but the first idea was that those were eggs of some aquatic animal carried by birds right up in the sky. Later tests proved that the jelly substance was a chemical that acts as a water lock and is used in many commercial products, even cables to protect them from water. Australian spiders are notorious, and to frighten people, they even learn how to rain. Spider rains are a pretty common thing for Australia because of ballooning. They climb up trees, then spin strands of silk, and that's why the wind can carry them away. Usually people don't notice it, but when it's wet, hundreds of spiders climb up to more desirable places. People say that when it rains or snows, it's possible to see spiders literally drift down on those webs as if they were balloons. If you ever travel to the Mekong Delta, you'll probably have a chance to see glowing balls rising up from the water and beelining straight into the air. The locals call these the Naga Fireballs. Sizes may vary, so these reddish balls can be as tiny as a cherry and as large as a watermelon. During the night, you can see dozens and sometimes even thousands of fireballs. Scientists don't have any solid explanation why it happens, but it's probably flammable gas released by the marshy environment. Still, a local superstition claims it's all because of a giant serpent living in the Mekong. Tornadic water spout is a tornado that doesn't occur on land, but on water. The speed of the tornado can be really high. The water is collected and partially pulled up. It manages to pull fish and even turtles up into the air. Actually, raining fish can also be explained by this weather phenomenon. The same might happen on the snow, too, but it's really rare. There are only six pictures of snow spouts, four of which were taken in Ontario. This weather phenomenon requires that the water is warm enough to produce fog while the air temperature is really cold, next to impossible. Lava is red, sky is blue, I'm on bright side, and so are you. Okay, I made that up. But the part about the lava being red can change. That's true, especially if you see the lava flowing from Kauai Jen volcano located in Indonesia. It has a typical red color during the day, but at night, it turns luminescent blue. No mystery behind it, just tons of sulfuric acid. This volcano also has the largest acidic crater lake in the world. The water there is so turquoise, you want to jump in immediately. But you probably already guessed that you should never ever do that. The fire on that volcano is also blue, and it's the largest blue fire in the world rising up to 16 feet. In some places, water may look like glass. White salt ponds might look like windows or even portals to the world underneath. They have their look because of salt evaporation, and such lakes can be found in France and India. But the Cargill salt ponds in the San Francisco Bay Area look even crazier because of vibrant colors. The shades vary. It can be deep blue, grass green, orange, crimson, vermilion, and even magenta. The color difference is all about the different levels of salinity and tiny microorganisms living in those ponds. On the shore of the Baltic Sea in Kaliningrad District, Russia, there's an enigmatic national park called Dancing Forest. The pine trees are all crooked and twisted there. The forest didn't appear until the early 60s, when the pines were planted to make the dune sand in that area a bit more stable. It's probably the unstable sand that made those trees twist that way. Another reason why those trees are so crooked might be strong winds. Some people claim it has something to do with supernatural powers. They say this forest is a place where positive and negative energies meet. Locals believe if someone climbs through one of the rings in those trees, it'll add an extra year to this person's life. The throbbing hum in Taos, New Mexico has driven locals crazy since the 1990s. Low-frequency hum doesn't let you sleep normally. Even though scientists tried so hard to find the source of the hum, they failed. They blamed it on mechanical devices and even animals. The West Seattle hum, for example, was related to toadfish. Different variations of hum were also heard in the UK, Australia, and in some areas of the United States. Luckily, only about 2% of the world's population can hear it. Not to lessen clouds, or simply night clouds, are so rare because 1. They only form in summer, and 2. They can only be seen at latitudes between 50 and 70 degrees both north and south. To see those clouds, the sun should be already below the horizon, but the clouds still have to be in sunlight. 
It's possible for the highest clouds in the atmosphere, which are located about 50 miles up. We can't see them during the day because they're too faint. Fairy rings, also known as elf rings or pixie rings, are the enigmatic rings of mushrooms that appear in grasslands and forested areas. Scientists can't explain why these fungi can form nearly perfect circles. But the superstition claims that fairy dances would burn the ground causing mushrooms rapid growth. In fact, it's partially true. The mushrooms grow in places where grass withered. The Amazon River, one of the longest on our planet, stretches for 4,000 miles which is more than a drive from Vienna to New Delhi. But there's one river in South America that beats the Amazon River twice. First, it's wider. Second, nobody ever saw it. It's an Amazon underwater twin called the Hamza River, and it runs 2.5 miles underneath. Scientists found it 10 years ago, back in 2011. Don't blink, or you'll miss this rarest weather phenomenon. Red sprites are electrical discharges in the sky that look a bit like an aurora. It's super powerful, about 10 times stronger than any regular lightning, but it lasts just a couple of seconds. They were first photographed in 1989, and there are still very few photos and video recordings of this lightning. To make a video that can clearly show red sprites, it should be at about 7,000 frames per second. Well, I'm out. The moon, our little companion our only friend in the big, dark, cold space. It's not surprising that any events related to it, like solar or lunar eclipses, excites us. But how about the black moon, the blue moon, a supermoon? Have you ever heard of them? Well, let me tell you about it and how you can observe them. Let's get your calendars ready. The distance between the Earth and the moon is 238,900 miles, I've measured. Feels not so far, doesn't it? But trust me, most people greatly underestimate this difference. Did you know that every planet in the solar system, including Jupiter and Saturn, would fit between the Moon and us? Yeah, I couldn't believe it myself. The Moon is tidally locked to the Earth. That's why it's always turned to us with only one side. There are a few phases in a lunar cycle. The new Moon is the first phase. The Sun illuminates the unseen side of our satellite, so we can't see the Moon. It's almost invisible in the sky. The rising moon is the gradual growth of the light part. The full moon is the phase during which the sun completely illuminates the visible side. The descending moon is a gradual waning of the light part. And finally, another new moon. And the whole cycle starts again. There are 29 and a half days in a lunar cycle, so it takes around a month if we're not talking about February. But why am I telling you all this? So you can better understand black moon a rare astronomical event that happens once every 29 months or two and a half years. This term doesn't exist in astronomy, as it was made up by astrologers. It's unofficial and has several meanings. Black moon may mean the second new moon in a month. Usually, there's only one new moon per month, so having two is a rare phenomenon. It's caused by a slight discrepancy between the lunar cycle and the Earth's annual one, something like leap years. Black moon can also mean something else. For example, usually there are only three new moons per one season. Basically, one new moon every 30 days. However, if there are four, the black moon means the third one. There are also some less popular meanings. For example, that's what people call February without a new or full moon. This happens about once every 19 years. But what's so special about it? The satellite is wholly hidden in the sky during a regular new moon. But during a black moon, you'll be able to see its dark silhouette. You'll have to choose a good place without city lights. If you live in a big city, you'll hardly be able to see it without a telescope. Also, since the sky turns black during this phenomenon, you'll be able to see different constellations that were hidden before, as well as Jupiter and Venus. The last time this happened was on April 30th, 2022. You could observe it in most parts of the United States, except for areas in the Pacific, Alaska, or Hawaiian time. Aloha! Yeah, unfortunately, if this is the first time you hear about the black moon, you've already missed it. Now you'll have to wait another two and a half years. The next black moon will happen in September 2024 by standard definition, and May 19th, 2023 by seasonal definition. But hey, don't worry! you can always see another astronomical event once upon a blue moon. Now, I'm not mocking you, I'm being serious. You can still see the blue moon. 
Well, not literally, of course. The moon won't turn blue. That's just what astrologers call the second full moon in a month. The black and blue moons are similar by definition, but they're actually the opposites. If the black moon is a rare second new moon in a month, the blue moon is a rare second full moon. They also both happen every 29 months. Not so rare, right? Kind of ironic that this event was called the blue moon. Folklorist Philip Hitchcock assumed that the calendrical meaning of the term blue moon was first invented by the Maine Farmer's Almanac in 1937. Now, another interesting astronomical event is called the supermoon. Stock up on telescopes and look for some hills, because you'll see an exceptionally bright and large moon like the one we only see in movies. What exactly does a supermoon mean? You see, the moon doesn't revolve around the Earth in a circular orbit. Its orbit is elliptical, and the place where it's closest to the Earth is called perigee. A supermoon is a phenomenon that occurs when the full moon coincides with the perigee. Because of this, it seems to us especially large and bright. It looks 14% larger in diameter and 30% brighter than usual. By the way, this phenomenon is often confused with the so-called moon illusion. During the moon illusion, the moon is low above the horizon and visually appears larger in size. Of the 12 or 13 full moons in a year, three or four are supermoons. But most of them are not very significant. You probably won't see a difference at all. The most interesting ones are the rare large supermoons. During them, the moon actually becomes big. The last major supermoon occurred in 2016. Unfortunately, large-scale supermoons are rare and occur about once every 18 years. The next one will happen only in 2034. But we can observe smaller supermoons quite often. In 2022, they'll take place on June 14th and July 16th. There is also an opposite phenomenon called the micromoon. You've probably already guessed what that means. It happens when the full moon is at its farthest point from the Earth. This point is called apogee. The next micromoon in 2022 will take place on June 29th. In 2023, we'll be able to observe it on January 7th, February 5th, and August 16th. Of course, you don't have to follow each of these events. Most people are more interested in lunar and solar eclipses. By the way, are you one of the people who confuses these two events with each other? Test yourself. Pause this video, describe what these two eclipses mean, let's compare your answer with the correct definition. Are you back? Okay. So, a solar eclipse is a phenomenon where the moon entirely or partially covers the sun. A solar eclipse is possible only during the new moon when the moon itself is not visible. Many people believe that this event is incredibly rare, but this is not quite true. A lunar eclipse is a phenomenon in which the moon is entirely or partially in the shadow cast by the Earth. The lunar eclipse can only happen during the full moon when the proximity of the moon is on the node of its orbit. If you guess right, well done! If not, hey, don't worry, many people confuse them. In 2022, a partial solar eclipse will occur on October 25th. It'll be visible in Europe, South and West Asia, North and East Africa, and the Atlantic. As I mentioned, a total solar eclipse is not as rare as many people think, but the problem is that it's not always visible from any part of the planet. So, if you want to see this event, be sure to look for their calendar and see from which parts of the Earth you'll be able to see it. And don't forget the special glasses. Lunar eclipses occur much more often, though. Partial lunar eclipses happen almost every month. But the total lunar eclipse in 2022 will take place on the night of November 7th to 8th you'll be able to see it in almost all parts of the world except Africa. I hear that the zebras are not happy about this. The moon is a genuinely fascinating satellite. You think whatever, it's just a small rock ball. But in reality, there are so many interesting things connected to it. What rare lunar events have you seen or want to see in your life? Have you observed any rare and interesting astronomical events? Be sure to share in the comments. Kwajan Volcano in Indonesia is not your ordinary lava-belching mountain. Instead of producing black smoke and red lava, as most volcanoes do, this eccentric guy lets out a blue flame, an electric blue lava. This phenomenon occurs because the volcano contains some of the highest levels of sulfur in the world. And when the sulfuric gases interact with scorching air and get lit by the molten lava, they start to turn blue. 
Unfortunately, you can see this mesmerizing sight only at night, but you can smell it all day long. By the way, the world's largest acid lake is also located inside this crater. The Dead Sea has a high concentration of salt and minerals compared to other seas, even though it's technically a lake. Swimming is almost impossible, but people go there for the natural chemicals for the body. Floating on the surface is a great way to relax. This ancient body of water got its name because no macroscopic organisms can live there since it's 9.6 times saltier than oceans. Only a few bacteria and fungi can be found enjoying the salt. It's also Earth's lowest elevation on land at 1,400 feet below sea level. An underground crystal cave exists in Mexico, and it looks like some interstellar world. It's roughly a thousand feet beneath the surface, with each spike measuring up to 35 feet in length and weighing up to 55 tons. These are some of the largest crystals in the world. Lescantire Beach is an endless strand of white sand dunes in azure water. But don't let the tropical vibes fool you. It's located in Scotland. That's why it mostly looks like this during May and June only. In December, the place gets only an average of one hour of sunshine per day making it way more dramatic and monochrome. The Georgia Guide Stones is a collection of giant stones in a star pattern. It has inscriptions in eight languages, including Hindi, Chinese, and Swahili. It also has an astronomical calendar finished in 1980 and was built to last centuries. No one knows who built it or why. All the way over in sunny California is Sequoia National Park, home to the giant forest. It's been around for thousands of years. More than 8,000 of these colossal trees rule the land, including 10 of the largest living plants in the world. The General Sherman Sequoia is estimated to be up to 2,700 years old and is recognized as the world's largest known living tree by volume. The famous stone heads of Easter Island have been around for hundreds of years. No one knows exactly why they were built. Some scientists think that local people believe the statues would make the soil more fertile. Soil analysis proved the heads did their job well. It's the best agricultural spot on the island. The chemical composition of the ancient hot springs in Pamukkale, Turkey, makes the water pouring over the edge look magical. They're not only good for cleansing your body, but the mind too. All the way in Saudi Arabia is a rock sliced perfectly in the middle with two pieces sitting parallel. What makes al Nasla so unique is that it wasn't artificially done, but is a result of nature's work over the years. Now this glacier may look like someone dropped tons of red paint in the middle of Antarctica, but it's actually the natural color. Blood falls is a result of extreme salted water mixed with iron oxide, giving out this eerie vibe in the middle of nowhere. In early May 2018, New England observed one of the scariest and most dangerous phenomena ever, a super long track tornado. The frightening natural phenomenon started not far from Charleston, New Hampshire, and traveled toward the town of Webster in Merrimack County. It took the tornado 33 minutes to cover 36 miles and become the third on the list of the longest track tornadoes in New England. In the Philippines, you can swim in some of the most crystal-clear waters and discover an underwater world below you in the province of Palawan. The municipality of Koran has white sandy beaches with many small boats riding through the many amazing sceneries. Tristan da Cunha is a small volcanic archipelago in the Atlantic, with the only neighboring cities of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Cape Town, South Africa. It takes seven days by ship to get to this unique place. If you want to escape from the rest of the world, staying with the 280 locals will make you feel like you're away from everything. During the first week of January 2018, unusually cold weather in the northeast United States froze the Atlantic Ocean in North Falmouth, Massachusetts. What's more, the ocean was frozen so thoroughly that people were walking on the waves. Now, that's obviously something you don't see every day. Red sand is what makes this beach unique and why tourists flock to Tianjin, China. A red-colored plant called a sueda salsa dwells in the salt water. The whole beach is covered in red, with only the top layer of the sea visible. If there ever was a thing that said, I defy gravity out loud, it's the stone of Davasco in Argentina. 
The huge 300-ton boulder stands precariously on the edge of a cliff and rocks a little bit from side to side in the wind. People even checked it by putting glass bottles under one of its edges. They exploded with another movement of the rock. Unfortunately today, you can't see this wonder of nature as it was a century ago. In 1912, the boulder suddenly dropped from its perch, which it had occupied for literally hundreds of years. The people of the nearby town of Tandil were so sad about this event that 95 years later, in 2007, they decided to restore the stone. They made a plastic replica of the rock and put it on the same spot and even in the same position. So, even today, coming by Tandil, you can see its famous balancing boulder. More of a symbol now, of course, because it's no longer rocking and only weighs 9 tons, but instantly recognizable nonetheless. Socotra is an alien-like island off the coast of Yemen in the Indian Ocean with one of the most unique trees ever seen. It's called the Dragon Tree, and it can only be found on this amazing island. In 2008, it was labeled as a World Heritage Site. If you ever see a tight-burning column of air, don't panic, it's not the end of the world! The creepy combination of whirlwind sounds and scorching inferno means that you have crossed paths with a fire tornado, also known as fire twister or fire whirl. This dangerous phenomenon occurs mostly during wildfires. These fires create a big area of super hot air just above the ground. When this scorching air gets mixed with the cooler air higher up, it results in a whirlwind that churns up burning debris and flames. The most powerful fire nados can stretch hundreds of feet into the air. The House of Mystery in Gold Hill, Oregon, amazes its visitors with gravity-defying effects. You can't stand straight there, always leaning to the side and having to hold on to something for balance. Balls roll upwards. There's also a broom that stands perfectly still wherever you put it, unlike virtually everything else in the shack. The local Native American tribes called this place the Forbidden Ground even before the house was built there, and they avoid approaching it. The owners of the shack, though, decided to turn it into an attraction, and they succeeded. They created an atmosphere of mystery around the place, and spread the news about it in newspapers and later on the internet, and voila! A perfect anomaly is made. In fact, it's no more than a curiosity. A human-made optical illusion that tricks your eyes and other senses. Now, if you travel to the Philippines, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, you'll have a chance to see some of the most unusual and cheerful trees in the world. The trunk of the rainbow eucalyptus looks as if it had been painted orange, green, red, purple, yellow, brown, blue, hey, you name it! Some trees are so bright that they seem artificial. The rainbow eucalyptus regularly sheds strips of bark, which reveals a bright green layer underneath. A bit later, this green layer gradually changes its color. And since the shedding happens at a different time in different places on the trunk, the tree starts to look multicolored and very attractive. Yemen is home to the oldest skyscrapers in the world and the oldest metropolis. The ancient city of Shabam is considered to be the Manhattan of the desert due to the collection of mud buildings popping out of the desert floor. It used to be a caravan stop during ancient times. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share